Hello, welcome to Secure the Continent with me, Binga Aburawa. This is the show where we bring you up to date with all the security happenings on the continent. But before we get into today's program, let me bring you the latest security headlines across the continent. Guinea charges a deposed leader, Alpha Conde, for murder and assault. Attack on Chibok and northeast Nigeria leaves a seven dead. And Russian mercenary group Wagner accused of human rights abuses in the Central African Republic. Also, Mali cuts ties uh, with France. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Today on Secure the Continent, we will be looking at the security situation in Somalia, where we understand that Al-Shabaab has been waging a deadly insurgency against Somalia's a fragile central government for more than a decade. We have more details for you in this package. In recent times, Somalia's deteriorating security situation has seen comparisons and parallels drawn with what the world saw in Afghanistan. Elections have been held and new leaders have emerged, but the Al-Shabaab terrorist organization is still a menace. Just on Tuesday, Al-Shabaab jihadists attacked an African Union base in Somalia, engaged in a gun deal with soldiers, and killed at least 10 peacekeepers from Burundi. It was the first attack on a peacekeeping base since the AU transition mission in Somalia replaced the previous Amisom force on April 1. The attack also left at least 25 people wounded. The terrorist organization has been responsible for several attacks in the troubled Horn of Africa nation for at least a decade. The organization wants control of the government as it attacks innocent Somalis and government parastatals. Car bombs are a regular occurrence in the country, and suicide bombings are never a strange sight. Its fragile central government and many unsolved political issues have ensured there are cracks for Al Shabaab to pierce through. What is next for Somalia? Could Al Shabaab seize power? Now, joining me to discuss this and make sense of this all, uh, three gentlemen, Mohamed Ali Abdi, he joins live from Hamburg, Germany, is the founder and director, Institute of Youth Economic Security Stabilization in Somalia. is also the author of the book, Why Somali Does Not Get the Right Direction. My second guest is William Els. He's a senior training coordinator in terrorism and explosives related incidents at the Transnational Threats an international crimes program at the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria, South Africa. And the third guest is Zabolks Emil Kovacs. He joins in live from Bogota in Colombia. He is the Associate General Manager, Risk Solution Africa, and former advisor, Combating Radicalization, Extremism and Violence, Ministry of Endowment and Religious Affairs in Somalia. A warm welcome to you all, gentlemen, and thanks for joining me and Secure the Continent. Thank you. I would like to start with Mohamedek. Who are Al Shabaab and what's the genesis of this group? Um, allow me to speak a um, little bit um, before Al Shabaab and what they want in Somalia. Um, as we know, um, the topic um, we are going to discuss is Al Shabaab can be susceptible to power. Um, or not. But we have to understand security and Al Shabaab, they are separate. Because when we talk about security, our, fund our fundamental human being, but Al Shabaab are so that the security has no power. So that's why they have so many chances to implement it, what they want in Somalia. But Al Shabaab has two uh, groups. Group Somalia, 
and group criminal people with um, Somalia came to try to fill their program to Somali's people. But the question is, a Somalian National Army are willing to defeat al Shabaab? My argument is no, because Somali army is a clan loyalty and politics, because Somali National Army is still organized and is still split in clan lineage, not many soldiers are loyal to the government. Politics politicization for the military. Somali, whoever came to the president, he is trying to, um, to, to make military leaders who do not play his rulers and hire a person who wish his, um, who wish his, um, his, his wishes. Consequently, some of military units will support him while others are opposite him. Somali security, when we talk about Somali army, Somali army are based by clan based. And each clan based has authorized someone. Mohammed, my, my question is Al-Shabaab. We'll get to the Somali National Army later in the course of a program uh, looking at us capacity to deal with al-Shabaab. But what is the genesis of al-Shabaab? Who are this group? What are its objectives? As I, as I already said, al-Shabaab, there are two groups, one Somali, and the other is a, a group criminal who comes to Somalia because of Somalia has no government, which is trying to capture okay. all the country. So the criminal people, who are there, which um, trying to defeat, to trying to feed their programmes to the Somali people, and the Somali people they carry out the agenda and they try to kill each and everyone. Actually, what I want to say to you now, the Somali people who are with Al Shabaab, who do, they do not know what they want, and they do not know their target. So that's my. If you don't know what you do, you will do what you don't know. So okay. Th th thank you, Mohamed. I would like to bring in uh, Sir Bogues here. Uh, uh, Sir Bogues, thanks for joining the program. Now, according to United Nations experts, uh, Al Shabaab raised more than $21 million it spent in 2020 on fighters, weapons, and intelligence. How has Al Shabaab been able to still be? an effective and formidable threat after all these years. What drives its recruitment and where does it get its funding from? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay, you. Okay, hello. Thank you for the invitation and uh, greetings to the distinguished guest. Yeah, uh, as uh, my period was in, in Somalia from 2019 to 2020, uh, having worked with uh, several uh, security forces which, which uh, have uh, contact with uh, the FGS, uh, FMS, uh, and all parts, SNA, SNP, uh, they got a lot of support because of the polarization of the actual uh, social and political um, leaderships uh, in the Somali society. And for example, if I can remember, um, in 2022, the European Union uh, provided funding in around 61 million euros to the federal government of Somalia for, the, for a couple of um, capacity, capacity buildings and diverse programs. And sadly, a lot of this money uh, flows back to directly to Al Shabaab because of um, the political um, instability, uh, we have the security instability, and then uh, the most important, which is, which is very well exploited by the, the group, is the social composition of the Somali society. Mm. And then if we can imagine since uh, 2017, the European delegation, the European Commission uh, provided 458 million euros of aid to Somalia, and I'm just speaking about one entity. I'm yes. not speaking about the UN, Amisom, and so on. States, so, yeah. 
Exactly. And other partners which are uh, very closely aligned with the FGS and helping directly Somalia with funds and also with military equipment and, uh, and other equipments as well in diverse fields. And these money sadly uh, directly goes back to Al-Shabaab and then therefore they have substantial financial revenues and capabilities to continue the insurgency by How do they go back weapons. to Al-Shabaab, uh, How do Sorry? these monies go back to Al-Shabaab? Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very complex. It's, it's a very complex system. And I, I think Mr. Abdi uh, knows the best because I just was um, as an international staff, and, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not myself originally from Somalia, so yes. he knows that's how it functions with, with, the, with, the, with the clan structures, with the families, with the connections. And also, uh, we have to say openly, uh, the political interest of certain individuals in the Somali society who eventually become governors or, or administra mm -hmm. administration key players, which have the key channeling for this money. Mm. And then as the periods goes by and governments change and electoral periods come, that's what we have in Somalia. That's why it's always was postponing the, the, the elections because each individual, each group, interest group wants to have access to the money. And then uh, by that, um, I think uh, we, can, we can state that, that Al-Shabaab is a good business in, in Somalia, and, and sadly, that, that, that the average Somalis and, and, and the country itself uh, is suffering uh, from it. Uh, thank you very much, Sabolk. So I'd like to bring in uh, William here. Now, William, we've heard uh, about Al-Shabaab's funding. We've seen its capacity to cause a damage, and we've seen a recent increase in its attacks, and some are more brazen, like the type uh, that took place on Tuesday. Now, how... What has been the regional impact of Al-Shabaab attacks? And have they been able to carry out attacks outside uh, the border of Somalia? Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, uh, you know, Al-Shabaab has been there for several years. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, even before the deployment of Amisom, they, uh, they were very active. And, uh, and, and after that, uh, Amisom was deployed. Uh, and and uh, there was a unilateral also deployment by the Kenyans that crossed the border to secure, to do a secure, uh, sort of establish a secure area, a buffer zone between uh, them and, uh, and the Mogadishu. Uh, we see that uh, they attacked uh, the uh, Westgate Mall in, uh, in, in Nairobi, Kenya. They kept it for four days. The attack lasted for four days, and uh, we all uh, must have followed what happened in the aftermath of that. But that was not the only attack. There were several attacks, smaller attacks. Uh, there was the attack in Garissa, where they killed about 170 plus uh, uh, students at the university. Mm -hmm. uh, then there was also uh, the Dusidi two attack uh, more recently uh, in in uh, Nairobi itself, uh, where uh, they attacked. But they, they didn't on, uh, only attack uh, uh, Kenya. Uh, we uh, go back to tw 2010. Uh, during the Soccer World Cup, uh, the, I, I, uh, during the final, actually, yes. a match of the Soccer World Cup, there were uh, two uh, major attacks in uh, Kampala uh, where they detonated three uh, IEDs or improvised explosive devices that killed many people. Uh, then also, uh, apart from those two countries, we also saw that there were two operatives from Al-Shabaab in Addis Ababa, that were busy uh, constructing an improvised explosive device in order to use it in Ethiopia, but uh, something went wrong, mm -hmm. and they actually uh, detonated the uh, the IED in the uh, apartment where they were constructing mm -hmm. it, and they were killed. So those are just some of the incidents that we can mention where they uh, move outside of uh, Somalia. But we see inside Somalia, they almost can attack at will, we, uh, we, you referred to the attack on, uh, on Tuesday, where they attacked the, the camp of the Burundian, Burundian soldiers. Uh, yes. That was not the first attack on Burundi uh, soldiers. Uh, we, it goes back to 2011, where they also attacked uh, uh, the Burundi base. Uh, we see that uh, Burundi claimed that there were 10 of them that died, but eventually it was established that more than 70 
of no, uh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, uh, William. Uh, we've seen that this is not the first attack on Burundian forces in Amisom, or as it's been changed, Artems. Is there, are they deliberately targeting Burundi, or is just uh, opportunistic attacks on, on any foreign forces on Somaliland? I think it is a deliberate attack on any foreign force uh, there, uh, especially part of Amazon. Uh, and now uh, we, uh, we, with uh, the, the Atmos, we, uh, we saw that uh, they attacked Burundi. Then they also attacked uh, at Al Ade, the, the Kenyan base, where they killed almost everybody in that base. It was a massacre. And then uh, there was also attack on the uh, Ethiopian base as well. So, uh, so they do it basically at will. Uh, they very well planned. They're very well organized. They, uh, the Uber, modus operandi is, is virtually always the same. It's been the same uh, for, for many years because uh, it, it worked. And, and then we saw that they, they used a similar, similar modus operandi with attack now in, uh, in, uh, on Tuesday, where they actually use a vehicle bomb and they drive it right into the gate. In this instance, it seems that they used two vehicle bombs that they drove into mm -hmm. the gate, they detonated and then uh, in the sort of uh, uh, chaos that follows after that, they then storm the, the camp. Uh, and that is normally a pre-dawn attack where people are sleeping. And then they kill as many as possible. Uh, quite a disturbing situation there. I'd like to bring uh, Mohamedek in. Now, Mohamedek, as the big, from the beginning of this year, we've seen uh, brazen attacks. Uh, for the first time, the... Uh, airport in Mogadishu, the Halane Airport perimeter, was breached for the first time since 2014. 16 people died. We've seen attacks on Somali National Elections uh, Commission officials. We've also witnessed this latest attack uh, on the Atmis uh, base housing uh, uh, Burundian forces as part of the Atmis contingent. Mohamedek, what is responsible for this latest escalation and violence was seen uh, from Al Shabab. And uh, is there something about the timing? Are they trying to send a message? For this attack, um, for the new base Al Shabab took um, recently a week, um, it's not um, something new. It's um, usually happened to Somalia because, um, and the reason is. Um, is whoever um, left it from Al Shawab and uh, came to the government and when whatever he when, and he said, I used to be Al Shawab and I left it and now I love to join it, the National Army of Somalia. Automatically, the government are welcoming, they accepted, and then automatically they did not send him this person rehabilitation. Because still, he believes um, the ideology that used Al Shabaab. And then, when he joined the National Army, and then he became a devil agent, yes. then, he will, then he will have access to Al Shabaab if they want to attack the bases from Amazon. He will have access to, to, um, to allow the security forces um, to attack um, any bases they want. So my argument is if, if Al-Shawab or if the government of Somalia want to win Al-Shawab, it's not, it's not by war, it's not attacking. It's the only way is to whoever come to the government to send it mentally, well-being, psychological. Because if this person has a devil agent, how can you trust him? Yes. How, can you, how can he make sure the security of the people? I do believe the next government of Somalia will have a more trouble than what is Al Shabaab is doing now, because the next government Al Shabaab is planning to um, have a more connection, more ministerial, more uh, ministries, and more um, 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 elections. So that's why, if the government of Somalia, next government, did not have a clear vision. Regarding um, this extremist, I do believe Somalia will be having a trouble situation. Okay, thank you, Mohamed. Uh, and elections are coming up shortly. Parliamentarians have just been elected in Somalia. I'd like to uh, 
bring in Issa Bolks here. Uh, Sir Bolks, in the course of uh, your work, you've uh, worked uh, with the Somali National Government, the Somali National Army and police. How equipped are these agencies, the Somali National Army especially, to deal with the Al-Shabaab threats and, uh, uh, and the insecurity issue in Somalia? Because uh, the ordinary Somalis seem to get no respite from uh, the deadly attacks from Al-Shabaab. And it's been going on for way too long. How equipped are the security agencies and the Somali National Army? Uh, how well equipped are they to deal with the threat of Al-Shabaab? Um, yeah, uh, they are quite, um, there are some units who are trained by the US or the Turkish or other uh, in the partner, partner countries and also by the EU who have a UTM capability building mission in, in Somalia. Uh, the equipment, it, it's quite, quite basic. It's almost like a Russian, mostly Russian, old Soviet type of uh, military hardware. But they also have quite considerably the last time received uh, a huge support from the government of Turkey and um, especially uh, the president of Turkey who has um, um, personal interest. He was um, very involved um, in, in the development and, and the relations uh, in Somalia and especially in the, regarding the, the SNA, SNP and the uh, MISA. And uh, they are... Uh, providing a huge support for them and, and training as to enhance the, the reaction capability of the SNA and all the security forces. The most uh, probable and most professional and, and, and the, the most uh, equipped is the, the Somali uh, SNA special forces. And uh, they are under the guidance of the US uh, and especially the AFRICOM. And they have um, go mostly on training base, uh, training bases in, in, in Kenya. Mm. And also they have in, in Mogadishu, they have a base in the Halane, in the, the green zone, where they do uh, train these individuals who uh, take part in the key, very delicate uh, missions to enhance their fighting capabilities. But still it's quite limited. And let me emphasize here because um, Al-Shabaab, is, is very successful on the social level. And, and if I may emphasize here, if, if, if uh, Mr. Abdi can correct me, we can speak about the, the zakat. And it, it was the, the first thing when, when I arrived in 2019 in Somalia. Yes. For example, one Somali individual who is traveling from, from Kismayo to go to Kedo or Bay or Galkayo, um, it goes through a checkpoint which is controlled by Al-Shabaab. And he pays the fee and then receives uh, the, the, the tickets that, okay, you pay the, the fee and then you can proceed on your way. And this individual goes away up to Ghetto or Gakayo or whichever locality. Uh, he doesn't have to pay anymore. So, so you, but this if, situation, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you, Sabolt. The situation you just painted is almost like a failed state because you have a government within a government. Uh, there should be Somali exactly. National Police presence in all these places. Are there vast ungoverned spaces in Somalia that Al-Shabaab takes advantage of? Or is it just an unwritten law and, uh, and they just get away with even collecting taxes? No, the, the issue which I'm trying to, to explain is yes. why they are successful in, in recruitment and uh, territory gain and to, to, to still have this reactive capabilities to uh, inflict huge attacks inside Mogadishu and all over Somalia is because the FGS and the FMS states are um, undermined by corruption. Hmm. And then these automatically, for example, referring for the first example from Kismayo to pay, uh, one local Somali has to pass through 20 or 10 or 15 governmental checkpoints, and they have to pay each bribe money for each governmental checkpoint. And then at one point in time, it's just basic human nature it will say, look, for these guys, I just pay once and they leave me alone and, oh, they, yes. and I'm not harassed. And then here you have the, the, the capability for recruitment. And the other side is that this action behavior, because of the lack of training, mentoring, capacity building for the SNA, uh, SNP and all uh, FGS security forces are itself undermining the authority of the state. And that's why uh, we have now such uh, situations, what we are uh, seeing in, in Somalia. And that's why they are keep uh, winning against SNA, SNP, then can infiltrate um, uh, various uh, cities 
and even institutional uh, um, uh, buildings like that we had the, when, when the Mogadishu mayor was killed by a suicide bomber. Mm -hmm. It was a, a press conference and it was infiltrated. So, yes, um, they, if, if um, this continues and, and it doesn't, doesn't change, um, yes, it, it, Al Shabaab uh, can, can uh, conflict serious damage. Uh, not that much since the, they lost Mogadishu in 2009 when the FGS took over. But still, if it, this trend continues and it didn't change that much, uh, uh, despite the, the huge support from the international community and also regional partners, um, it, it can easily change because all in all, the average Somali is, is uh, on the ground in, in the cities, in the houses, in the villages, and they have to live there. And, and eventually they can they they decide which side they they, they will take uh, voluntarily or involuntarily because of this uh, direct or indirect yes. uh, uh, inputs inputs in the, their daily day life uh, thank you very much uh, sir Bulk. the situation uh, is quite dire and is in the interest of international partners and regional partners uh, to take care of the situation but there seems to be hope on the horizon uh, with presidential elections coming up and just concluded uh, parliamentary elections. I'd like to bring in uh, William here, still talking about uh, the situation, uh, the security situation in Somalia. The, on the 1st of April 2022, the African Union uh, mission in Somalia, AMISOM, ceased to operate and transformed into what is now called ATMIS, the African Union Transmission, Transition Mission in Somalia. How significant is this change and what are its terms of operation, and what impact would it have in the overall uh, war against Al Shabaab in Somalia? Uh, yeah, uh, if you want to compare uh, Amazon to to, to Atmos, you have to look at the at the mandate. And if you look at the mandate of Amazon and you look at the mandate of uh, of Atmos, it doesn't differ a lot. Hmm. Uh, so uh, th we have to. But, but Admis has a fixed uh, date of operation. They have they have just two that's years. It. Yes, that, that's it. So they will focus now on by the end of uh, by 2024. They have to hand over to a Somali government and security forces, and then they are responsible for the security of the country. Uh, but if you if you look at at, uh, at the, the the mandate, the mandate is still to stabilize. The mandate is still to. To, to, to secure areas, et cetera, et cetera. The numbers did not uh, change that much of Atmos uh, in terms of, of, of soldiers and police and also the civilian corps that is there. But uh, what we saw, and, and, and that is something that, uh, that was the first difference I saw between what happened with Amazon when they were still there and now with Atmos is uh, that they one of the changes is that they formed rapid intervention forces or rapid reaction forces and and that happened on tuesday it was implemented when the attack was on the on the burundi base immediately mm. the 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 the, uh, the uh, rapid reaction force was then activated and they responded with gunships and helicopters and they actually saved the day for the burundis otherwise there might have been many more of them killed like what we saw in 2011 in 2011 what they did then is, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, took an ox cart, they loaded it with explosives, and uh, they sent it down the road. Uh, as it uh, reached uh, the bridge over the little river, uh, that uh, actually uh, uh, the main road where all the, the reinforcements were going to come from, it, they detonated this, uh, this ox cart, or IED, and uh, it, it destroyed the bridge. So re your, your response of your uh, reinforcements could not reach them, and they actually had a field day killing so many of mm. uh, these Burundian troops. So there we saw already a difference in how the, the uh, Atmos is now reacting to a situation. They're much more prepared, and also it seems that they are much more equipped to, to deal with that situation. Uh, uh, for the rest, uh, they will still have to, to train, they will still have to equip. Uh, like uh, our previous speaker said, uh, there was a lot of training, the Americans are training, uh, 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 African Union is training, uh, some other European countries are training. The, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, myself have been training uh, the, the bomb technicians of the police in, on, on, on post-blast investigation, also in reaction to IEDs uh, for, for uh, 
for uh, Somalia in order to equip them to, uh, to be able to start, stand up and to do what Amazon and what Atmos is doing for themselves. If they will be ready to do so, that is a question for another day. Thank you, William. And it's good to see that lessons have been learned from uh, the Amazon mission and uh, they're trying to uh, make sure they don't make the same mistakes Amazon made. Gentlemen, we'll go on a quick break and when we return, we'll be looking at uh, preferring solutions to the intractable uh, security situation in Somalia. Do stay with us. Secure the continent. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us and Secure the Continent. If you're just joining us, this is Secure the Continent. And we've been discussing the escalation of violence in Somalia after Al-Shabaab attacked an Atmis base housing Burundian soldiers, killing over 30. I still have here with me Mohamed Ali Abdi in Hamburg, Germany, Sabolk's Emil Kovacs in Bogota, Colombia, and Willem Els in Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you very much for staying with us. Now, Mohamedek, uh, just last week, uh, con elections were concluded, parliamentary elections were concluded in Somalia, and uh, there will be, it's been announced that presidential elections uh, will take place on the 15th of May. Now, how significant of a breakthrough is this uh, in the grand scheme of things, providing security and electing a new uh, president for Somalia? And how much of an impact does the fighting between uh, the current relationship between Pre Pre Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Robley and uh, President Mohamed Abdullahi Farmajo. Does it have an impact on the security situation in Somalia? In terms of um, the impact of um, President Farmajo and the Prime Minister Robley is um, become um, the worst day by day and uh, even the situation which is um, become the worst, it cases that um, the security become under control. Nevertheless, um, the country is become uncontrollable. Um, Al Shabaab um, attack it um, continues, and um, because the challenge um, and the power sharing that um, the president and the prime minister will cause so many damage and so many security um, uncontrollable to the capital of Mogadishu. But coming to the, um, your question, what will be um, the next president of Somalia? Yes, and, and the new parliamentarians uh, uh, yeah, that have been sworn. Yeah. Yes. But, but, but the question is like um, the 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 security in Somalia at the moment is very complicated. And uh, what I can say is like um, um, Al-Shabaab and the uh, Somali National Army are becoming mixed. What we have saw um, um, a couple of months ago, the national security agents, their Facebook has wrote it, there is a tweet um, President and Prime Minister, because Al Shabaab are going to kill the Prime Minister and um, uh, President. So it means that cases show you that how Al Shabaab became a mixed um, Somali National Army. But my fear is like if the next government of Somalia take the power, 
and this government um, um, will not. Um, it, ne the next government of Somalia and this government will have a space that Al Shawab can take more Exploit. chances and can play more on the ground. So if the next president came to the office, if he did not, as I said before, if he did not have a strategically clear how he can defeat this extremist group, I may assume he will be suffering a lot and he will not defeat this extremist group because they are everywhere in a, in a parliament, in a government office. So I may assume the next of government of Somalia will have a lot of work to do if they want to succeed their country because they have to complete the constitution which is not completed. They have to fight um, al Shabaab. They have to well train it, Somali National Army. And I do believe my conclusion is to achieve sustainable and effective Somali army, the army should be separated from complex client politics and be given a space to transform itself so that it will help mm -hmm. Somali national army, not only wholly any group and any group and this serve the government of the day and the entire country without fear and prejudice. So that means if Somalia, if the new president came to the office and he called to the state ministers and they sit together and they highlighted a new architecture security plan and they have to put their interest behind and they put a national interest first, I do believe they can win. I do believe they can reorganize. I do, I do believe they can succeed. But if they started to fight each other in um, federal uh, members and uh, the central government, so uh, Al Shabab also, would take advantage of this uh, fighting uh, between government factions uh, and wreck more damage. Uh, thank you, Mohammedek. I'd like to bring in Sabolz here. Uh, Sabolz, like Mohammedek said, uh, it's not only uh, military solutions that we'll have to uh, tackle, that we'll have to use to tackle the intractable security uh, uh, problems in Somalia. Uh, he did talk about. Um, about infiltrations by Al Shabaab spies in the Somali National Army and politicians are also using uh, Al Shabaab for their infighting. The new government definitely has its uh, work caught up for it. Now, looking at ATMIS, the new African Union transition mission in Somalia, it's been given less than two years to hand over security responsibilities to the Somali National Army and withdraw from the country. How can they avoid the mistakes Amazon made? And do you think in two years' time, the Somali National Army will be able to handle the security of Somalia? Uh, no, no, they will not. We will have the same situation what we basically see saw in, in, in Afghanistan. For example, when, when, when the, the, the security forces uh, were drawn and then they were transformed in, in some sort of, of training and, and advice mission. And after that, we saw in a couple of, um, of months, uh, weeks, uh, we can say the downfall of, uh, of Kabul and uh, the, the Western support regime. And it will be the same in, in Somalia. It, it needs to be a more but, more clear, concise uh, But, but that's, a, that's to, a very pessimistic picture you just uh, painted because uh, they yet to elect a new president. Two years is quite a long time, but uh, what, what made you say that? Uh, it, it's due uh, with, with um, uh, the dynamics uh, of the region, of the regional um, surrounding countries' interests. So it's, it's very, very complex. So uh, the new president, the new government, which, we, which was elected, uh, will have um, a, um, a huge task ahead to fulfill and also to Im implement um, the, the, the needed policies and also to, to create that, that trust between, uh, you know, the ministries and the mm -hmm. politicians and also to implement that, that, that the, so to say, the rule of law between uh, the army and, and the security forces. Um, so if you allow me, I want to add one point. What he said, um, 
the question you ask him, um, are the Somali National Army as capability to retake uh, the security yes. from ethnic? Um, before I answer this question, um, allow me to speak a little bit point which we, which we need to understand um, the fundamental of um, Somali National Army because um, Somali National Army has got um, many international actors who are supported and give it training. Um, for instance, um, Somali National Army has uncoordinated, um, uh, for example, in British, um, they have their own camp in Beda Boso, uh, West State. In Turkey, they have their own um, military base, Turkey Som, in Muktisho and they have their own strategic model. In Britain, they have their own strategic model. In America, uh, 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 in US, they have their own um, camp in Beledogle. And Qatar, they have their own Emirates. They used to be, but the government was um, conflicted. But the question is, if each actor is, they are feeding their own strategic model is, difference from others, mm -hmm. and the armies are Somalis, they did not understand each other. They have no vision, sharing national vision, how can defeat Al-Shawab? How they can exactly. be taken, how can they, how can they retake from the Al-Shawab? So my argument is, if international are willing to support Somali, is to put parity sharing national vision to entire Somalia, including federal, then it will be accessible. Somali National Army, entire Somali National Army have a vision, um, same uniform, same strategic model, then it will be accessible to retake their country from Amazon. Uh, thank you, Mohamed, uh, for pointing uh, that out. It's uh, very nice to have one uniform army and uh, everybody's uh, strategic uh, objective should be in line with that which favors the Somali national government and not international actors. Thanks uh, for pointing that out. I would like to bring in uh, Willem here. Uh, you, so in most of these conflicts that are especially asymmetrical warfare, you really have to calm down uh, to the table to dialogue. Otherwise, it would go on for years. We've seen that with the FARC rebels in Colombia and uh, with uh, the, the, the Bath uh, in North Spain, uh, the Basque separatists, and also uh, Northern Ireland. Are Al-Shabaab, are they averse to negotiations? Uh, and have there been, uh, have there been efforts to uh, resolve this conflict through a negotiated settlement in the past? Uh, you, you are very, very right when you say that uh, in, in this type of warfare, uh, the outcome is eventually uh, that there will have to be negotiations around the table uh, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, what is maybe the problem with, uh, with the composition of uh, the Atmos uh, uh, forces there is that, you know, you cannot solve a political problem uh, with, with the military. Uh, and that is, that is what I believe what is the problem in, in Somalia. It is more of a political nature that should mm. be solved around the table than uh, through the barrel of the gun, even though you have to stabilize the situation before you can sit around the table. So uh, we see that we've got 18,000 soldiers, we've got 1,000 policemen, and we only got 70 civilians uh, which are there to try to facilitate the political process. Mm. So uh, uh, that, that is maybe uh, an indication that uh, things are not uh, going to go so well with the emphasis not so much on uh, sitting around the table. Because at the end of the day, uh, uh, you must also understand when do you negotiate? Uh, e e every, every, every side would like to negotiate from a point of strength, strength, from a point of authority where they can be there. So we can see that also above, uh, things have been going well for them. Uh, we can see that, uh, you know, they managed to infiltrate government, they managed to infiltrate the military, uh, they are controlling big swatches of land, they are collecting a lot of tax, they're getting a lot of money, as was discussed earlier. So uh, they are actually the de facto government in the rural Somalia. 
things are going well for them, why would they now exactly. like to come uh, to the uh, to the to the uh, uh, negotiation table? So we will have to create situation where both of those parties are willing to to negotiate. Unfortunately, so the other elephant in the room, uh, uh, so to speak, is that it's not only in Somalia, but it's very prevalent there is the matter of corruption. Corruption is really uh, undermining mm. uh, all efforts uh, in terms of what we need to, to reach in order to create a stable uh, society within uh, Somalia. Uh, thank you, uh, William. Uh, just before we wrap things up, I'd like to bring in uh, Sir Box, because he mentioned Afghanistan earlier. Somalia bears uh, many similarities to Afghanistan. In both countries, uh, you've had uh, an Islamist government uh, project uh, in, in both countries, you've had uh, a lengthy period of conflict uh, where Islamists took over the central government and outside powers uh, have come to wage war uh, in this country. So is an Afghanistan-style implosion of state institutions inevitable? And could Somalia be the next Afghanistan as we wrap up? Um, as we saw last year when... It was the political deadlock. It was the, on the brink of it. A uh, um, lot of um, international staff was evacuated. A lot of embassies were on the brink of evacuation. They made plans. So it, it was it was very, 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 very mm -hmm. close. So there was very uh, intense negotiation on a high level with very, very high implications uh, to make in trying to, to, to find a consensus and also to calm things down. Um, so far, now we have to see, uh, and, and we have to wait a, li uh, wait a little bit how this this installation period for the new new government and also the new uh, elected uh, uh, leaders uh, to see how can they manage what also uh, Mr. Willem was was saying that this dialogue and how it, they can emphasize to how to to, to devise a plan to to counter um, uh, Al Shabaab. If not, then uh, yes, yes, it, it can be a, a very probable uh, implosion like, like we saw in Afghanistan. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to say a big thank you to you gentlemen. Mohammed Ali Abdi in Hamburg, Germany, Sabox Emil Kovacs in Bogota, Colombia, and Willem Els. Thank you very much for being a part of the show and sharing your insights on this subject. I really appreciate your time and contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Now, ultimately, the decision to pursue a negotiated outcome to the civil war in Somalia rests with its Somali belligerents. Uh, nonetheless, the United States and its partners can offer a firm nudge by removing some of the implements of war and adopting a strategic framework that recognizes politics as the arbiter of peace in Somalia. Thanks uh, for being a part of Secure the Continent today. I am Benga Abora. Join us next week for another edition of Secure the Continent. Goodbye.